Welcome, everyone, and thanks a lot for joining us in this webinar uh, um, with a discussion on the Hungarian elections and the implications for the rule of law in Hungary, but also for Europe and the rule of law as a whole. Um, because last weekend, of course, all our eyes were uh, at the Hungarian elections, uh, because a lot was at stake. Uh, would Orban have the chance to continue its backsliding uh, 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 of the rule of law and, and move from a democracy towards uh, autocracy? Uh, or would there be a game changer and that we could start restoring the rule of law in, in Hungary? Um, because as we all know, of course, the democratic erosion in Hungary has reached a point that NGO Freedom House no longer considers the country as a, as a democracy, but a hybrid state states between uh, democracy and autocracy. And uh, well, as we know, of course, we saw Orban's victory. Uh, we now know that he has uh, gained 136 seats out of 199, uh, even uh, slightly more than, than he had. And um, well, we want to talk about that, of course, how this went. Uh, but also how um, uh, what the implications will be. At least he was not congratulated by uh, the EU and many member states. Instead of that, uh, the president of the Commission, Mrs. van der Leyen, announced that it would trigger the conditionality mechanism against Hungary, meaning that the EU funds uh, uh, will be cut uh, due to, the, uh, uh, to all the deficiencies in the rule of law in, in Hungary. Um, and with that, uh, approximately 40 billion of euros uh, is at stake uh, of payments uh, from the EU towards Hungary. So um, a, a lot will happen, I think, after this. It will not be business as usual in any case. Uh, it will be a further uh, regression or it may be a further clash also between the EU and Hungary. And it may also have implications for EU's foreign policies, of course. So I'm very happy to talk uh, with uh, Esther Salam. She's a journalist of the, for EU Observer and she's covering uh, the European politics and especially the rule of law. A warm welcome to you, Esther. Very happy that you are here. Uh, and Anna Unger, and she's a researcher at the Department of Human Rights and Politics at the Hungarian UTUS. Um, uh, Utfus uh, Laurent University. Uh, thanks a lot to both of you uh, because it must be a really a weird time uh, at the moment that you found an hour time to, to, to talk with us. And uh, my colleague, Gwendolyn Delbos Corfi, she is a Green MEP, she's rapporteur on Hungary uh, for the Liber Committee. She will join us uh, somewhat later uh, also to discuss um, uh, the further actions that the EU might take or uh, should take uh, uh, due to the victory. So um, I would like to start with Esther. Esther, maybe just the first question, how did you wake up on Monday morning? Um, well, it was more the night of, of Sunday night that was, that was very interesting to cover. I was in Budapest and uh, it, just the speed of which, with which we found out uh, through the results that it's a it's a it's a two-thirds majority again. That was that was uh, surprising, definitely. I mean, I think everybody expected um, a Fidesz win, a win for for uh, Orban, but I think uh, two-thirds uh, was a surprise in itself, and also just the the the, the massive and very very straightforward win was, was probably a surprise to, to many observers. Yeah, and I, I can imagine it was a kind of a, a blow. I mean, and what was the atmosphere? Can you say something about that of people really yeah, hoping for a change? Um, well, th th this comes to, yeah, this opens up a bigger question. I was at the, at the uh, opposition uh, camp uh, that, you know, they were expecting the results. The mood was quite somber from from the beginning, and actually, at at the time when the the result became pretty clear, you know, opposition uh, politicians were leaving uh, for home, and and you know, it was it was it was um, it was you know very it, they were in shock. That was clear, and mm -hmm. a few few hundred supporters gathering 
Um, but it's actually open, you know, it's, it speaks to the, to, to, to the realities of Hungary. I mean, there are basically two realities um, that, is, that is happening. It's a very divided country right now, uh, just as the, we can say the US or maybe other um, countries around the world. Um, it's also down to how the media functions in, in Hungary. People are just, who consume one uh, part of the media have one idea of reality and, and people who consume another um, type of media have a very different understanding of what's happening in the country. So it's difficult to say what were the expectations. Of course, sitting in Budapest, uh, the expectation there was, of course, that the, the opposition parties would perform much better. Um, I'm not sure if that was the expectation in other parts of the country. No. And uh, of course, it was very quite unique that there was an observation mission from uh, uh, from OD from uh, OSCE, uh, and they uh, released um, well pretty critical report, I would say, uh, on Monday about the, the the election process as a whole. Can you say something about this? How fair and free were they these elections? Yeah, sure. I mean, they were free in the sense that. Uh, voters, of course, in the privacy of their ballot, in the voting booth, could to, could choose whatever they wanted. Although there been there was an opposition M MP who said that some some people demand uh, uh, pictures of of the vote, um, so that's even you know questionable. But uh, the fact is, you know, it's free in the sense that you choose, you pick whatever you want in the privacy of the of the of the voting booth. Um, or even though people might be reluctant to share their politics because they're worried about the um, possible negative consequences on their jobs, on, on, on various aspects of their lives. Um, but I don't think it can be called a, a, a fair election. I mean, and this is this was also what the OSCE, the observation mission, was was putting forward, that it's not a level playing field. But it's also not something new. I mean, the OSCE had missions, even if not full scale, but had missions in 2018 and 2014 too. And they were st already saying that it's not a level playing field. And they put forward 20 plus recommendations four years ago that none of which would have been taken aboard by the government. So the fact that this is not a level playing field is not something new. The, the reason why, uh, you know, parties in the opposition from from far right, far right to to urban liberal intelligentsia had to unite is 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 also because um, uh, the electoral law was changed in the in the first term of of the Orbán government. So um, I think this has been an issue um, for a long time. This has been a dilemma for opposition parties for a long time. How to how to approach that? I don't think that. Boycotting is ever really uh, considered because then it's uh, then they don't then, then then that minimum chance of getting their message out there is 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 made impossible. But this is not a new issue and and um, and it has been uh, a tilted uh, level playing field this time as well. And uh, you you also mentioned the vital role of the media, eh? making it hardly. Uh, hardly possible or almost impossible for the opposition or also for other actors to to bring forward their message to get through. Um, what is your expectation now with the new regime, with the continuation uh, and even the more cemented uh, uh, power of Orban? Will it further deteriorate or is that not possible actually? Uh, what expectations do you have uh, about this um, well, this oppression through the media and other ways. Yeah, um, I mean, it's important. The, the media the, um, dominance by the government and Fidesz is, is key. And this has been singled out by the opposition candidate, prime minister candidate Peter Markizai, also in his speech on the, on the night. Also, I want to say, though, that, I mean, there is a tangible support for Orban in the country, uh, whether that's how much of it is manufactured or is genuine. That's, uh, that's, I don't think we can really uh, find that out ever, but there, there is a tangible support for, for Orban in Hungary. Um, on the, in terms of the media, I would expect that uh, things will get worse. Um, Orban has a, feels that there is a huge legitimacy for, for his policies. His grip on power is cemented once again by two thirds majority. Um, I would expect that there will be more econ economic and political pressure on the remaining uh, independent or government critical media. Um, 
I would I could imagine that there there would be maneuvers pressure on on the one um, television broadcaster RTL Club which is uh, which is critical of the government um, that uh, Orbán's government tried that before that hasn't succeeded I could imagine a push again in that direction and I would just also highlight the personal toll of the journalists that work for um, these these uh, independent or government critical organizations I mean this is a uh, you know, this takes a personal toll to be um, on on this to to be um, targeted at the same time while working under very difficult conditions. And um, also, just want to mention the issue of surveillance um, with the Pegasus software uh, by the government on journalists, but also on the on the head of a publishing house uh, that still hasn't aligned with the government. So that's you know, it's not only journalists but but uh, businessmen that could come under pressure that still um, supports some, some of the independent media. Yeah, Th thanks a lot, Esther. We will come back to that later, hopefully also how the EU could give more support to, uh, to independent journalists, for instance. I would like now to turn to Anna Unger. Anna, uh, you work at a Hungarian university. Uh, we just heard from Esther that the expectations were actually not that high. Uh, how did you feel after the election results became uh, clear. Was it also not a surprise to you or, yeah, what was your first reaction? Uh, <clears throat> th thanks for having me and, and, and telling the truth, I, I had no high expectations and high hopes, but not because I knew in advance that this would happen, but instead because I handle Hungary and I take uh, the case of Hungary as an electoral autocracy for four years. I wrote some articles about this fact and that's why I, I tried to convince my colleagues in advance that if, you, if we, we try to understand this system as a competitive system, we have to face the fact that this kind of competitiveness will be balanced by state authority. Uh, those states, that state authority and state actors like uh, the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court or the audit, Auditory Office or whatever, who will balance the relative competitiveness and the relative strength of opposition uh, uh, from the other side with not state repression, it's not clear repression, but state opposition and support towards the government and Fidesz party. So in this respect, unfortunately, I had no hopes. And the only thing, I, I had a tiny uh, uh, ripple of hope that maybe the two thirds wouldn't happen. But when I saw the results and when I saw that um, our home, our country, this the Mihazank Mozgalom, this new uh, I would call it, it, it not national radical, but far right party uh, reached the, the, the threshold. It was quite clear for me that with or without them, two thirds will be okay because they would support Fidesz whenever needed. If, yeah. if they do not reach a uh, two thirds major, majority themselves. But now if we take the result, it's quite clear that um, they have a minority representative in the parliament as well, who represents the German minority. Uh, and uh, this was the same situation in the last uh, electoral cycle, in the last uh, parliament. And uh, he supported, I mean, that, uh, that representative supported Fidesz whenever it was needed. So in this respect, unfortunately, I was, let's say, hopeless. So I had no, uh, I had no fair dreams or expectations on that night okay no but still when it happens and even when it's even higher than 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 you might expect it's um it, it must be a blow could you say something about this two-third majority what could that mean for for the politics of of orban i mean he has already uh, 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 change the constitutions in many ways uh, uh, do you expect more constitutional uh, uh, reforms or other ways of um, in increasing or cementing the oppression. I mean, we already see that uh, a lot of polit political appointments on institutions that are supposed to be independent. Uh, I mean, there were already 
a lot of uh, uh, um, well political decision uh, threatening um, or, or undermining the rule of law. But what more do you expect now, now that he has consolidated uh, his power? That's a very good word, consolidated power. Actually, I see four different uh, things, or I have four different expectations. The first is that this two-third majority means an institutional access to constitutional system. And uh, this is a long uh, standing, uh, well-known practice and strategy of Fidesz that they create, let's say, the, the frames. And whenever it needed, whenever it, it, it whenever it's needed, whenever they they have to do something against the op opposition, they fine tune the system. So this will happen again if needed with two third majority. Uh, for instance, they uh, uh, passed the 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 current electoral system, the the frames and the, the basic laws of this electoral system in 2011, but actually i cannot tell you one year when they did not uh, uh modify the amended the lead electoral system there is a continuous legislation uh for electoral issues and also whenever it needed they can amend the or the basic law and so this will remain with us that okay i have the two thirds i do whatever you what i want and the basic uh, I mean, procedure of this is that one uh, smart representative from the Fidesz uh, uh, launched the new bill. It takes it during the night, usually. You wake up in the morning, that, oh, there is a new proposal. And within a few days or few weeks, it's already passed. And the Constitutional Court usually uh, does not uh, stop or does not uh, uh, find it unconstitutional. So this is the constitutional level, let's say, or institutional level. They can do whatever whatever they want. And uh, you, you ask me, what does it mean? It means that he can do whatever he wants. And I think this is the most frightening sentence uh, concerning a democracy, because democracy is about uh, checks, democracy is about balances, democracy is about constraint constant constraints and counter powers in a system. This thing doesn't exist in Hungary. It, it hasn't uh, been existed since 2010, but we usually had the hope that maybe the EU, maybe the Constitutional Court, maybe the international community, someone will stop this. Now, I hope and I do hope that it is pretty clear to everyone that we cannot stop this from the outside only, and we cannot end it from the inside only. So there must be a very strong mutual cooperation uh, in in the next few years about the the, the about the redemocratization of Hungary. The second part is the is the personal part, and uh, I think it's uh, the one big toll of of. Orban uh, forced to third majority for for the Hungarians and Hungary. Yeah, the hopes of democracy is that he has the power to change people for more than in, a, in an electoral cycle. Uh, just one example: um, the the head of media authority, the media council, resigned a few months before this election. And they could use that two-third majority to replace that woman with another person who has the, the, the tenure for, I guess, it's, it's 12 years or nine years. So it's way, way longer than the electoral cycle. So now he can re-strength, reposition those people who are his person, let's say his puppet in the system at the head of constitutional court, at the head of Supreme Court, at the head of each and every so-called independent uh, constitutional uh, institutions that would, uh, in theory, protect democracy against government. So this kind of checks and balances will be even more distorted because of these two thirds. The, the third uh, uh, level or the third uh, part is it's about economy, and and it means that uh, uh, 
analysts tend to call this system crony capitalism, but I think it's it's an understatement. It's not simply a crony capitalism. It's it's rather um, a, a, a leader or party capitalism. So it's really hard to get any kind of state finance or public procurement competition money uh, if you do not belong to the Fidesz. And we can see it, and I really have some some uh, scary dreams and nightmares about this one, the privatization of universities. We had only four state finance uh, uh, universities so far. One of them is my university, and I have you no know, hope that, uh, or, or I cannot expect anything else that we will privatize as well, which means not a formal and normal privatization, but it will mean that they create a, let's say, public-private uh, endowment where the board is full with Fidesz politicians and mm -hmm. Fidesz uh, uh, friends, and they will lead the university. Just to mention how crazy, how unthinkable uh, this is, this never happened during socialism. That, 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 that socialist state party representatives or state party ministers shall be members of university leadership. And this happens, this happened many times in the last few years, and this will happen with the rest of the universities. So this kind of economic uh, uh, conquest to 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 conquer the rest of the Hungarian economy will will continue and and I really wonder what he will do but this is probably a different uh, this would be a topic of a different uh, discussion what he will do without EU money because his second financial background the Russian economy is right now it's not available. Uh, and and this is re this will create a really interesting situation how he can handle the the missing EU money, and this is this leads us to the fourth part mm -hmm. international effects. Uh, we could see in 2015 and 16 a very strong campaign against EU and the United Nations. It was really unbelievable that you you were walking on Budapest and you could see billboards with the with the sign that the United Nations cannot force us to do something though it didn't want it to and it didn't that there was no sign but it was so that the UN cannot force Hungary and also the EU cannot force Hungary probably every everyone remembers the blame cam blaming campaigns against uh, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and George Soros and so on now what I expect uh, uh, in relation or, or with the with the uh, uh, the procedures the EU EU launched uh, uh, yesterday and and on Monday and, and Tuesday, that this kind of EU blaming campaign will continue. It will be much harsher. It will be stronger, more. Open. Uh, more more aggressive that can and this is the biggest fear of many millions of Hungarians that can base the decision to leave the EU yeah yeah so this can be and I, I I I would like to warn everyone that in the next four years this will be one of the key issues whether Hungary remains within the EU or in the EU or not yeah, so yeah, the yeah. High. and uh, indeed, and and the more uh, uh, critical uh, citizens actually leave the country, the more consolidated the power of Orban uh, becomes, of course, in Hungary, because people who can still, you know, uh, uh, create some counter uh, uh, weight will um, will will disappear or fade away. So this is, I think, a nice bridge to go to Gwendolyn uh, Delbos Corfield because you mentioned Anna uh, that uh, well the clash could become harder if the EU also starts using its instrument and hung, uh, Orban is going to fuel uh, the framing of the uh, EU as an enemy. Uh, but before I go to Gwen, I would like to to invite the public uh, please uh, uh, make your questions, write your questions down in the chat because the last 15 minutes we will uh, um, uh, use 
to um, to ask these questions and have a, have a small debate uh, with all three. Uh, but now we go indeed to Gwen. Gwen, you're a rapporteur uh, on Hungary, uh, uh, dealing mainly also with Article 7 procedure, which is a political uh, procedure in the Council between the member states where they have uh, uh, different stages to go through with uh, as a last measure actually taking away the voting rights of, of, of uh, Hungary. Now, it did not uh, go very uh, smoothly, actually, this Article 7 procedure due to a lack of political will. What do you see as perspective now uh, for, uh, on the one hand, the Article 7 procedure? Would there be more appetite for member states to, to increase, increasingly use that? And can you say something about, indeed, this conditionality mechanism, um, which might be triggered? Uh, could that be effective? What effects do you expect? And what should we be uh, uh, alert uh, on uh, during this procedure? Yes, hello. Um, yeah, I, I always said that um, whatever would be uh, the, the result of the elections, uh, Article 7 procedure should be pursued uh, because the deterioration of, of laws, um, of, of liberties, rights, democracy, rule of law um, is, um, is systemic and it's a long lasted um, situation. As, as it was said by the Anna, um, they, they, they have also installed people for a very long time. They, they have people in places in what is supposed to be independent bodies or uh, in board, university boards or, or that sort of thing for, 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 seven, for terms of seven years, nine years. So anyway, even if the opposition had win, um, they, the cemented um, uh, Orban, Fides uh, organization and the way that they have managed to channel the money always to, to their friends and to themselves is, is really uh, uh, very important. So we would have needed anyway an article, the Article 7 process to, to go on because it's going to take time to re-establish democracy even when it will start to do it. Of course, now um, there's little hope that uh, they, they will even be appetite from the government to start re-establishing democracy. Um, so we need even more to go on the Article 7 procedure the Article 7 procedures foresee, as a first point, hearings of the, 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 the government, which has been sort of sanctioned, or not sanctioned, but uh, there's an alert with this government, and so the, the, the procedure is, is, is triggered. Um, and in these hearings, they are supposed to explain why they are doing what they're doing and how they could uh, come back to regular standards. Um, these hearings have been erratic. It was difficult to get them. It was already uh, from the member states um, that were in, having the, the presidency. It was always for them very difficult. They would consider this as a as something uh, delicate to do. Um, they 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 find that it's not very nice to be judging uh, one of those, theirs, and all of this. So the Finnish managed to do hearings and the Portuguese managed to do hearings, but every other presidency, it, then it would the process would completely stop. We will be having a hearing during this French presidency and as soon as the 30th of May, it was confirmed yesterday again by the French presidency. So this, then we will get this new hearing and these hearings should really now be on a regular basis. Every presidency, we should have a hearing because the situation is not getting better. But now we must also step up the process to get recommendation, which is already very difficult because this is a qualified majority. It means the 20 member states out of the 27 need to, to have the courage and the political will to, to, to sign these recommendations and they need to be not uh, washy recommendations, they need to be serious ones. So this is already something. I do hope that this step we can have because um, indeed there will be now member states that will maybe step out of their very neutral attitude. They have had a neutral attitude. For example, the Baltic countries, they always considered it was difficult for them to take a stand, so they would never interfere in any way, didn't vote things. 
Um, the situation with Russia, the Ukraine war, the attitude of Orban with, uh, towards Russia could change this. Uh, so I do hope a bit more involvement of the Baltic countries. And I do hope that everyone is now aware so much of the difficult situation that also more me member states will become proactive and we could get recommendation. The step of the sanctions, this is um, hugely um, uh, unlikely for the moment. This is a unanimity vote. Uh, yeah, this is, this is withdrawing votes for Hungary is really something I don't have hope to see quickly. Uh, but it would be, of course, the logical thing to do. And then next to it, as you say, there has been there's the triggering of this a new mechanism that um, says that you cannot get money from European Union for certain funds if you are not um, uh, in a rule of law situation, normal rule of law situation. It has been triggered for Hungary. We've been waiting for this for a long time, and this will be really very important. Because, as it was said, the money today is used as a tool in Hungary to punish those that I do not agree with you. So you don't put any money, you don't invest money in roads, you don't invest money in schools, in, 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 um, in, in transportation, mobility. So all of these people in Hungary who live in a village or a, a city where the mayor is not close to Orban, they will have very, very bad infrastructures, and all of those that are close to our band, there the money will come. So there's a complete misuse of the money, but there's also disappearation of part of the money because there's corruption, and there's also money that really directly goes in the pocket of, uh, of close people from our band. So this, stopping this is very important because Europe needs to stop nourishing this system. Can, can you say something about, uh, because we still need to wait, I mean, it can be zero, it can be 10 euros or it can be uh, 10 million uh, euros that, uh, that may be cut. Can you say anything about the criteria? Because, um, well, we, we think, you know, if, if there's no implementation of our judgments, if there's a lack of independent judiciary, if there's corruption, there should be actually no money more flowing into the country. But can we expect something like that from the Commission or will it be much more, um, let's say, a modest uh, uh, financial sanction? This, yeah, this is difficult to say because since the beginning, um, Commission is not um, transparent with us and not always even very nice. Um, we were told this... Um, this Hungary file was ready since month, then we were told that it wasn't the case anymore. And then suddenly yesterday, uh, Ursula von der Leyen made this statement that, um, and we were in the, 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 the impression that this, this would never happen. So it's very difficult to know what. It has to be recalled that how they managed to get a, a deal on this was at the moment of the budget, the, all the member states had to agree on this. It was unanimity. So of course, Hungary and Poland didn't want it, so it was very difficult. They managed to get something uh, written, um, but uh, because it, the discussions were so difficult, this is a very difficult tool to use. It is specifically said that you have to show the link between the use of the European money and how rule of law is a problem with this money. It's not just there's a problem of rule of law in this country, so we don't put money anymore. It has to, to attack clearly the European money, which also means that, of course, since the beginning, we always thought that it would be easier for Hungary than for Poland, for example, because in Poland we have much less um, uh, corruption. Uh, it's, 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 there's probably a bit, but honestly, Poland is not accused by that, by the European institutions. There's no documents about that. In Hungary, yeah. it's so huge, the corruption, that we always knew that it would be easier for Hungary to, to take this link because it's specifically European money that has been uh, misused uh, and has been disappearing. So this, this we know that they, that's, that's, the, the argument that they use, we already know that. We know that that's where they went for. Um, and then um, it could be that you say, they say there's so much corruption because honestly, um, uh, Hungary is really um, very highly marked by a number of uh, European international institutions to be very corrupted. So 
they could say, you know, we cannot put any money anymore there because it always is misused. Mm -hmm. uh, it's known that uh, uh, even Orban family gets the money. So that, that's who gets the procurement when there's competitive, uh, indeed, uh, uh, um, money to be, to be get from the European system. So I think for myself, for the moment, it should be, nothing should be given. And um, everything that should could be given should be given with very tight negotiations and conditions. And then the dream situation, which is today very difficult, is would be to channel ourselves the money to, for example, Budapest, to certain territories that have never been where investment has been so low. Uh, and to certain civil society. This is for the moment not really possible because there's no legal basis for this in the way European money is used. But this should be a, a way for us to, to, to work. And we hope that in the next years we, we all brainstorm to get there. Yeah, exactly. Because what we also hear, that especially mayors from opposition parties, uh, that they uh, uh, really have troubles getting state money uh, to simply uh, exercise their duties. So, um, yeah, they may really come under pressure and therefore be more uh, in the hands, under the control of, of, of the Orban regime. Maybe, Gwen, uh, quickly before I move to others again, I mean, Anna, uh, I think very rightly uh, concluded that we can only get a change from both inside and outside. So there needs to be a strong relation, I think, between uh, uh, people inside who really uh, want to reform and, and internal pressure, but also EU uh, pressure. Um, do you see ways for the EU uh, for, to, to give more support to the internal movements, so the, the Hungarian civil society, opposition or whatever, to, to strengthen uh, their opposition and, 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 and pressure and, and call for more transparency and democracy? Can, can we do more than we do now? Well, first thing is, um, just very bluntly, I, I am concerned about people um, being desperate and leaving or stopping what they've been doing for years. I have um, some people I work closely with in civil society that have told me that maybe, you know, they would become barmen, barman for two years and, and just make a break because it's it's been so, so difficult all these years. So I think just showing support would be very important. And I think that the level of desperation when there's no infringement procedures coming from the Commission for things that are very easy to spot and to tackle, the fact that there's been sometimes a bit in council compromises made with, with our ban and all of this, I think this help, didn't help. Um, so just showing support and, and being there and having more often all the European institutions and not only the Parliament. Parliament has always been on the side of, of, of citizens, but, but not the other institution. That would be very important. Second thing is uh, we have a real, um, we have a real uh, responsibility, European Union, um, because we didn't do anything to stop the the concentration it's not just a bit of concentration it's 99 percent of concentration of media today accessing information that is not what uh, uh, the disinformation that is created by the government is become very difficult in, in hungary it's not just a bit difficult uh, if you are in budapest you can still access a bit it it will it will ask you to be very proactive you will need to go and look for an independent media in news in 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 to in 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 shops or or on internet or on the radio it will be very difficult on tv and all of this but at least you can outside of budapest it's even more difficult so this on this we have a real responsibility because we have left this information being created we have left government saying things about europe that are not true very often um, and um, and we could have acted because, you know, normally um, not only media pluralism is one of the value, but also on, on the very market point of view, normally a uh, single market means that you always have competition and all of this, and, and we should be, and they, you have infringement procedures going on all the time about competition, but bizarrely it didn't happen about the media in, in Hungary when very clearly 
everything was bought by a few people close to Orban, and then everyone was fired that didn't want to, to produce the narrative. And that, that has a real importance. I will give one example. Um, uh, I talked to people in Hungary that really believe that the opposition helped by Europe is going to change the sex of little children in schools. It seems completely incredible to us, but this has become a real narrative that people believe, and we let this happen. So I think acting on media would be something that we should really do, even if 12 years of disinformation have already made um, a huge, con have had huge consequences, I think we could act there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, th there will be, the Commission announced a new media act, so hopefully that will work, but I think they can already do more uh, in order to, uh, uh, to, to help media pluralism. Um, uh, Esther, could you say something? There was a question uh, on, uh, from the audience. Um, Judith Deitch, she asked, um, uh, is there any um, chance of, uh, let's say, Putinization uh, of the Orban regime? Do you see any limits <laughs> of, of, of further uh, repression or is this in, indeed, you know, the possibility that we will face a kind of Putin within the EU? Um, let me let me jump in with a few points on the on what the EU could do more, and then I'll I'll get to this this question, yeah. which is which is really really pertinent and really good. Um, in terms of uh, supporting media, I think um, I mean it's of course it's it's um, it's difficult to to uh, accept you know money from institutional players. So there is there is this this the, the ethical issue, but I think the old Commission has also made it very difficult to access uh, already existing funds because they are so specifically targeting projects and are not for core funding for media which should be which which would be really really needed you know just a day to day financing and that's not available so that would be one very specific point the other is the eu could be more visible in you know defending its own uh, points uh, you know the one time that really the eu jumped in was when um, commission president uh, juncker was attacked on billboards uh, that there could be more uh, visible proactive communication on the side of of the eu um, but also the question for me the question with all these processes that i've been following for the last 10 years um, and my issue is that the EU still hasn't figured out our strategy how to deal with this issue of having an autocratic ten tendency within the EU. Because what happens if we, uh, uh, if the EU suspend funds? You know, what's 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 going to happen the day after? And I just wanted to second uh, what Anna said. I mean, the possibility of at some point Orbán uh, pushing for for um, exiting the EU is 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 a real uh, fear. Um, I mean, it's usually dismissed by looking at polling numbers that the Hungarians support overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly membership in the EU, which is which is true and it's great. But let's not forget that there is a, a propaganda machine working in Hungary, and I'm 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 not sure that the can, that support cannot be turned around. Um, now to the to the question on on you know whether Orbán can maybe Esther done. can yeah. sorry Esther can I ask one question about this. Yeah. Do you think that that might be fueled also by the triggering the conditionality mechanism? So the less money uh, flows into Hungary from the EU, the more appeasing it would be for for Orbán. And and would he get any other funding? Any other? You know, could he get compensation outside uh, the EU? I, I think that that was part of the strategy, so so sort of um, to get funding from other um, places like Russia and China, and to compensate or to you know to sort of always have that, always show that to the EU that you know if you don't give me money, I can go elsewhere, and that's also a geopolitical problem for you. Um, so that's a very good question. Um, uh, I. Uh, it, it could be definitely used an, as an argument in a, on a practical side. I think it would be also, you know, um, used by the by the government saying if we don't get money from here, what what's the point of, you know, having us go there and being lectured even, you know, because now we get the money for it. But <laughs> if we don't get the money for it, what's the what's the po what's the point? Um, mm -hmm. So I can I can imagine that it escalates. So that's why I'm hoping that there is a 
a bigger strategy uh, behind this. Um, obviously, if someone doesn't stick to the rules, there needs to be sanctions. Uh, but it, I hope that there is thinking behind how to, you know, uh, what to do the day yeah. after. Um, and on the question on put Putinization, I mean, to some extent, uh, I've been reading uh, Anna Politkovskaya in the past few uh, weeks uh, because of the war in Ukraine. And um, to be honest, the, the, um, the mindset is so similar that it's, it's scary. Obviously, there's, uh, you know, nobody's going to jail in Hungary. Nobody is being killed. Uh, but the but the sort of the template of curbing um, a public space for debate, curbing uh, pre of media freedom, uh, judicial independence, um, uh, that's that's all you know pointing to that direction. And with this massive legit uh, massive uh, win, which is a massive legitimacy, uh, 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 two thirds for the fir fourth time. Um, in the parliament, I think that would uh, that also signals to Orban that his his you know, his his, uh, his policies are supported, that he can he has the legitimacy to move forward, um, and 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 like Anna and and Gwen said, the checks and balances are very weak or missing. Yeah. Yeah, that that really is similar to 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 Russia almost indeed, Anna. Um, you know, I, I had the feeling that uh, during the recent uh, weeks before the election, uh, Orban was a little bit more cautious, uh, you know, in its uh, pros or position towards uh, the Kremlin regime because uh, because of, of course, the Russian aggression and, uh, uh, well, there was a, a big need for the EU to be united and he did not want to spoil it immediately, but yeah, what will happen now? Now the elections, uh, you know, um, we are up behind, uh, uh, have have, um, have finished now. And do you think he will become more an explicit supporter again of the Kremlin regime? And, and what would that mean also for EU policy, foreign policy, uh, in terms of sanctions or, or other steps that we need to take? Mm -hmm. In some respect, I guess he's already on the Kremlin line. For instance, that in his victory speech, he blames Zelensky. This is this is almost unthinkable that you win uh, in a row a two-third majority again. And the most important thing you want to mention, you want to express that you blame uh, a. Uh, uh, a statement you blame your neighbor who is attacked, who is uh, in a war, and this is the most important. It shows some some way that yes, he will follow, not the Russian line, that but but he will support uh, uh, Kremlin against uh, against the world. I guess it's just one one very interesting sign that he offered and he invited Putin. To talk about to negotiate about ceasefire in Budapest with, with the Ukrainian government, the the the, the foreign minister uh, uh, blames uh, the Ukraine government all the time. And one very important thing concerning media that EU banned uh, Russia propaganda everywhere in Europe. What the EU couldn't do is to ban Hungarian state media which broadcasts pure 100 percent russian propaganda 24 hours a day and this is still uh, going on so in this way maybe orban said that he supports everything what the eu wants but on the other side he has the russian to maintain at least in one country their kind of argument their reasonings uh, concerning this war and the 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 latest news is as just uh, what I found uh, right before this meeting of ours that the Hungarian government is open to pay in ruble uh, for the gas and for for the oil, which is actually goes absolutely against the the, the EU uh, EU decision or the EU agreement. So I think that yeah, this strength this uh empowerment this this renewal uh, renewed empowerment of Orban will uh, uh, 
will will help to and will lead them to the to, to clo even closer to the to the Kremlin. And um, uh, it is very important. After all, I'm a university professor. Uh, as I mentioned, Politovskaya's diary. I would like to mention you another book, which is pretty important. It's Timothy Snyder's uh, The Road to Freedom. And from that book, you can even find it. It's really frightening that the Hungarian government does the same what the Russian government did four, five, six, eight years ago. For instance, labeling NGOs as foreign agents, foreign powers agents, is a Russian innovation. We uh, introduced them uh, that uh, for uh, a few years ago. So in this way, there is no, I don't see any reason to to follow the line with, together with the EU uh, from Orban's part. And unfortunately, in the last few weeks in the campaign, he, he already changed a bit. Uh, concerning his arguments, he he blamed and he attacked Zelensky and the Ukrainian government many times during his speeches. And the whole state propaganda was about that we have to, we we, we must remain neutral. We we cannot send arms. We cannot uh, 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 risk our country and our people. We do not want to decide who is the good guy and who is the bad guy in this situation. And they they usually claim that there must be peace, there must be some kind of, of, of negotiation between the two actors, but uh, he, he kept the distance uh, from, from, from EU policies. Yeah, yeah, so... In, in, in his rhetoric, but so far yeah. he supported with his votes. I, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if he, in the next, a few weeks, he would use his vote as a blackmail uh, to uh, stop or to, uh, to 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 block EU decision making in exchange for EU monies, for instance. Exactly, I, I'm 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 very concerned about that. Indeed, this is really his leverage because uh, yes. you know, with the veto, we cannot be united. We cannot be effective anymore, <coughs> and he will have exactly what he wants. So. We really indeed need, like, uh, as I said, a bigger strategy uh, around this. There was also a question from the audience about um, you know, this, the, the war in Ukraine and the number of refugees in Hungary. Uh, will that also impede EU stance regarding uh, um, um, less funding to the EU? I must say here we had a debate, uh, we had a decision on increasing the budget indeed for hosting countries, including Hungary. Uh, for hosting asylum seekers uh, or refugees. And uh, we know that in, in Hungary, just like in Poland, it's not so much the state that are offering assistance, yes. but the NGOs and, and, and the municipalities. And, and this is also reflected in an urgent letter uh, sent by mayors from Warsaw, uh, Budapest and Bratislava, calling upon the European Commission to, uh, to channel the money directly to the municipalities and the civil societies uh, in order to help the refugees. Because now if Hungary gets money for that, I mean, we don't have high hopes that it will uh, find it reach its destination uh, for the refugees. And because there is no asylum system anymore in Hungary, it has been destroyed for a long time ago. So this is really uh, also an, uh, an additional problem, but I don't think it stands in the way of cutting EU funding uh, uh, on, on other policy areas. Before we wrap up, there's also a permanent question also from Judith Deitch, and, and she actually wonders why the EU could not be more effective in combating corruption in Hungary or, or misuse of funding. I, th I think this is a very important question. She makes this the comparison with Greece, where we apparently managed to really, uh, you know, tackle this issue and, and come up with very uh, harsh decision, uh, forcing them to, to, um, to get more uh, control on, on, on their uh, uh, economics and, fi and, and financing. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe all of you can say something about that. Uh, I would like to start with Gwen, but uh, I also really would like to hear from Esther and Anna also how we could do that, because this is a very 
legitimate question, of course. We should not tolerate any any misuse of EU funding, of course. Gwen, uh, did we did we? Yes, sleep very or? quickly. I think there was first a, a really cultural, um, if if you can say that, problem. Um, I think that for a very long time, um, the budgetary questions, the 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 economical questions, the um, uh, you know being in the good deficit a number and all of this was more important than the rule of law aspect in European Union. This is something that was really awful. Um, I think we have gone out of this period. I think now rule of law as a core issue of European Union is 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 clear for everyone and and even for member states and we've come out a bit of this um, uh, doxa of the economist um, but it it, it is uh, completely unfair very very surely um, there are, to be clear, there, there have been some um, projects where European Union clearly said, you know, the money was misused. I, I know an example about uh, money that should have gone for Roma people and it didn't. And so there was um, the, the Roma people made a, a case about this. They won the case uh, and now Hungary has never uh, given back the money. Um, so that's a bit the problem. Then you have to get back the money and indeed we have a problem today i think in a lot of uh, legislative aspects and push infringement procedures and that sort of problems corruption problems where things uh, are, are done but then there's no follow-up and reinforcement uh, and and uh, commission and council must become much stronger on this Thanks. And indeed, you have this uh, public proc procurement uh, uh, um, uh, conditions that are not met. And maybe I, I can also add, we, we have now, not so long, a uh, European uh, public prosecutor for uh, combating uh, fraud with EU money. But guess what? Hungary is not uh, participating in that because it's, not, uh, it's for every member state free to participate. And Poland and Hungary are the ones uh, not doing so. This is, so this is also impeding uh, an effective um, uh, combat. But Esther, what can you say about this? Uh, do we need more transparency, or do you do you see more possibilities for the EU to be stronger on that? On the corruption. Uh, yeah. The corruption. Yeah. Well. Um, yes. It. I. I. Um, I think it's. The, the, there, there was a difference, and 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 like one said, I mean, uh, there there was a obviously uh, it, the whole uh, issue with Greece at some point threatened uh, the 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 euro. So that that is that is um, that that sent shockwaves through member states uh, that that prompted them to to act. I think the the crisis of rule of law doesn't have the same effect. Um, also, just politically, is not that much of a risk yet for for or for other member states government or they don't they just don't perceive it uh, as as such at this moment um nevertheless yeah there are there are all of uh, uh investigations going on there were cases where in the end actually hungary didn't even um you know submit the bills for a particular project because the all of investigation uh did uncover ir irregularities um but this conditionality mechanism should be you know, it's also it's, it's it has to have a direct link to to the EU budget. So it's not about all about rule of you know every aspect of rule of law. It's about um, the misuse uh, or management of EU funds. So this could be a tool, um, but uh, it it's it's also probably a bit too late in the in the in the sense that that uh, you know to really roll back the the system of of corruption. Um, and again, it's also political pressure. I mean, um, you know, just let's look at Bulgaria as well, um, where, uh, you know, um, it, it also had a, um, a prime minister from the European People's Party for a long time. And that was, uh, that was you know, um, the, the corruption there was not perhaps tackled uh, as, as, as much by the EU as it should have been. And also in Hungary, Orban used to be EPP. Uh, Prime Minister, so there, there was, a, there is a lot of political cover, uh, or there used to be a lot of political cover for EPP uh, leaders. Yeah, yeah. So, in, indeed, again, it should be both externally and internally, probably. Uh, Anna, I mean, I can imagine this level of corruption also means that Orban, you know, is simply appeasing his friends or his supporters, so that it's also only dividing more the country. 
uh, how does that work and, and how could that be, be reversed, turned around? Okay, what I can tell you is that the, the, the biggest problem in that this is a structural problem that Orban and Fidesz understands and knows how EU works and EU just starts to understand right now how Orban works. For just one example, uh, in in his first years, in his two first two cycles, they made a lot of, and they made them let deliberately. They made a lot of market steps inside Hungary with the voucher system, with the billboard system, whatever. They nationalized them. They uh, prohibited market actors to do what they wanted. They had openly anti-EU national regulations it took years for the eu to start the infringement uh, uh, procedure after all of course hungary lost all these infringement pr uh, procedures we had to pay i mean taxpayers had to pay billions of compensation for these companies but when the whole eu process was over the whole market was already rearranged foreign or international companies left the country and all these big business went to his friends and to his oligarchs now probably the whole state is already done in this respect so there are no international actors with the exception of the auto industry but i wouldn't think they want to 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 nationalize audi hungary hungary or, or suzuki or whatever but they have this kind of uh, constant negotiation and they have this kind of cooperation with German industry, for instance. But so the biggest problem is with corruption that this could happen is that the EU thought from the beginning that this is a decent government, this is just a right wing government, and they cannot deliberately overrule or overcome EU regulation. And it was too late to wake up for the EU. And what I see right now is that some kind of anger from the EU's part and some kind of, okay, that's enough understanding, just like it happened in the case of Greece. But on the, on the other hand, it's not corruption anymore because it's very easy to change the laws, national laws, national regulations to implement these, these corrupt practices and the, the state will say, all state authorities will say, this is legal. What happened with, with uh, ballot papers outside Hungary in the next few weeks, that NGOs and Fidesz party men and, and Fidesz friends collected ballot papers instead of the post office. And no one knew who actually filled those papers, and it affects thousands of votes. And the National Electoral Office said, this is legal. So right now, what probably the EU would have to do is that to, to make something uh, uh, for his best interest, for his best interest with this uneven playing field. That uneven playing field, I mentioned, it's not the elections, but between the EU and Orban, that Orban, Orban can easily overcome EU regulations because he knows that the EU is too big and too slow to react promptly and to uh, to give strong, effective answers on the next day. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, you say indeed this. It's not a this corruption is not a separate problem. Is deeply rooted in 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 the political it's part of uh, the constellation. System. Exactly, and 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 therefore much more difficult to combat. Actually, it's it's very clear from your contributions also that. We are now paying the price of tolerating for 12 years backsliding of rule of law. We are now, we have woken up, so to say, but it makes it much and much more difficult to, um, um, to reverse things, also even to reach out to the Hungarian citizens that uh, there's a, a need for reforms uh, in order if we want to preserve European values uh, in Hungary. Uh, and, and I think that indeed it's, it's only uh, um, even ne more necessary than ever that we stick to uh, the Hungarian citizens and their needs and that we try to reach them because indeed your scenario of exit, it's, it's a realistic one, of course. And in the end, I think citizens are only 
losing and uh, uh, and and I don't think that we can already say it's a very deliberate choice of them I mean not like with brexit or whatever this would be the result of a, of, of a long year's uh, uh, Putinization and I think we should be aware of that uh, and indeed think of a more bigger strategy as Esther said and 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 keep on being more vigilant towards connecting internal and external uh, um, strategies on reform. So I would like to thank you very much. I think uh, it's it will not be the end. We need to 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 strengthen our cooperation, and I wish you all the best uh, in these difficult circumstances. And um, also to the audience, thanks for your attention. Uh, um, we keep you posted and, and, and let's keep a close eye on, on what's further happening with the rule of law in Hungary. Thank you very much. Thank you.